Hey, Earthlings, how are you doing? So welcome back to another video uh, with me, Roger Yates. And um, now there's a an issue that's been uh, on my mind for a few weeks. If I'm being honest, it's been on my mind for about um, 35 years in the movement. It's a movement issue. So I will be talking a little bit of philosophy and a little bit of sociology. So don't turn off. It's going to be very kind of low key and uh, and kind of basic in that sense. So um, it's nothing to worry about. And um, the question that I or the issue that I want to raise is the one that I raise quite often. And it's about the animal welfare basis of the animal rights movement. You know, why isn't the animal rights movement an animal rights movement? Why doesn't the animal rights movement understand animal rights philosophy? These are the kind of basic questions. Now, I did an earlier video, I'll put the link below, which talks about the kind of history of this, about kind of why welfareism won out. So it's, a, it's talking about when in the, in the early 90s, the theories of Tom Reagan were becoming quite influential within the movement, but it didn't last for long and the welfare corporations kind of squashed it and it all died down. And that uh, analysis is from Reagan himself and also the Francion uh, counter movement. I'm more interested really in um, the perpetuation, the continuation of welfare in the animal rights movement, because we have a movement that prides itself on calling itself animal rights. Obviously, some people say animal liberation, obviously, but a lot of people will say that they're animal rightists, but they sound like welfareists. Now, from a sociological point of view, social movements are claims makers. We make claims. The claims we make are based on some of the principles of animal welfareism. The, the main ones that I see over and over again are we make issues about animal cruelty. We talk about... Um, loving animals and that we need to do that in order to uh, care about them and the issue that we should have kind of mercy uh, on or for other animals now you know to me it, it's surprising to me um extraordinary that an animal rights movement or a movement that calls itself animal rights would have an organization in it called mercy for animals now this is like ridiculous and, and a bit pathetic, really. You know, we're not begging for mercy and we're not begging people to don't be cruel. Please don't be cruel. Please have mercy. Try to be an animal lover. This is all irrelevant stuff. Animal rights is based on respecting the rights of other animals. So animal rights is a demand, a statement, an assertion. It's not begging for mercy or saying don't be cruel. It's saying other animals are rights bearers and that when we use them, that's a rights violation. It's a strong claim and it's a demand saying, where do you get the right to use other animals? Another way that welfare comes in is that everybody talks as well as cruelty and mercy and being an animal lover. They talk about animal abuse instead of animal use. And so there's always this kind of smell in the air that it's the worst kind. Now, I was going to include some some kind of uh, video clips in this and try to make uh, my videos all jazzy like uh, the crank does, but um, I don't know. So, Jake, um, <laughs> points out a 10 for, uh, for for that imitation so but I decided not to do that I don't I don't want to point to individuals although I have individuals in mind I don't want to point to that because from a sociological point of view we've got to understand that people everyone is socialized into a society which is totally drenched with speciesism and animal welfareism the idea that we can have non cruel use that's what we're brought up with and also, then you've got the socialization that takes place within the animal rights movement. And the socialization 
that's in the animal rights movement is all based on animal welfare. And I'm not quite sure whether people kind of realise this. If people don't have a grasp of the philosophy behind what they're saying, then I'm not quite sure that they can move away from it or challenge it or think about it. They just seem to kind of go along with it. And so, you know, there's a couple of YouTube um, people I have in mind, you know, one was on TV recently. It's all about cruelty, cruelty, cruelty. The people, the, presenta uh, the presenter was talking about animal welfare, high welfare, no challenge to any of this. Oh, it's all about cruelty. And then when the person did a response to his own interview, he then says that our job is to abolish the worst abuse and cruelty to animals. That's animal welfare. T to focus on the worst cruelty and abuse is animal welfare. To focus on animal use in total is animal rights. So then there's another, oh, this, this guy also said that veganism was strictly about animal ethics. So not only does the poor chap have no idea about animal rights and about how to put over an animal rights thing, never challenges, when people talk about animal welfare in the interviews, never challenges that and um, might get into debates about whether, whether the, uh, the farms are, are kind of um, high welfare or not totally irrelevant doesn't matter from an animal rights point of view they all violate rights that's that's the issue so the other chappy is on the tv talking to a butcher and the butcher also happens to have a small abattoir and so he asks the butcher how they kill the other animals and he says electrocution and the guy said and that knocks them out cold and then the vegan goes, oh yeah, but it doesn't happen all the time, does it? Yes, it does, the farmer says. No, it doesn't. And they end up in an argument about the percentage of times in which the stunning process works, how efficient the stunning process is, as though that matters, as though that if the stunning pro process worked 100% of the time, that would somehow not be a rights violation. But the point is, Rights violations don't come into it. In that interview as well, the presenter talked about cruelty and animal welfare, not challenged at all by the vegan. So it's been a bugbear for me, as you can probably tell. And certainly if you've watched any of my stuff and you've seen the stuff that I write, is there any prospect at all? that we could end up, you know, in the 2020s with an animal rights movement. Now, you know, instead of being kind of critical, I, di I didn't want to be critical. That's why I didn't want to kind of put these people on the screen. Um, I want to try and be positive. Now, one positive step, you know, and people like Sandra Higgins, Go Vegan World, Jeremy Hess of Vegan Interactions, they're doing this, is changing the language, trying to change the conversation and trying to cut through the fact that everybody thinks that we're concerned with cruelty and animal welfare and that we're concerned about if this farm has high welfare standards or if this particular farm lives up to its welfare standards. You know, is it living up to the red tractor scheme or some RSPCA approved bullshit? Right. Totally irrelevant from an animal rights point of view. You know, you can have the most humane, welfare friendly, high welfare farm in the world and they will still be committing rights violations. But we don't talk about it in these terms at all. We engage with the welfare paradigm. We engage with the welfare arguments. We don't cut through it because the beauty of animal rights arguments is that we cut through welfare. You know, some guy came up to, uh, we were putting up our vegan street thing in Dublin. Some guy came up and he looked at one of the banners that I was putting up and he goes, that's rubbish. And I said, what's rubbish? He said, well, you know, what we do is not cruel. And I said, well, you know, putting that aside, our position is based on animal rights. And he goes, no, it's not. He was telling me what our position was. And the point is, he learns that from the movement which is why 
the journalists ask us about animal welfare because they think that we're concerned with animal welfare. We need to cut through all that. We need to change the language. So instead of talking about mercy to, and, and cruelty, we need to talk about rights and rights violations. And it'd be good if we had a philosophical basis to that. And I recommend that people engage with the work of Tom Reagan. Now, the tragedy is that most people in the animal rights movement now won't have a clue who Tom Reagan is. Now, that is astonishing. It's, it's kind of beyond silly. It's beyond pathetic. It's just, frankly, weird that the person who originated rights-based abolitionist animal rights is unknown in the animal rights movement. How could that even be? Right. But that's true. There's something wrong. I've always argued that this movement is a philosophical mess. We need to do something about it. If we ever want to get beyond arguing with farmers about cruelty and about whether they love other animals or not, or whether we should have mercy for them, if you ever want to get beyond that, we've got to learn a bit of animal rights and learn animal, you know, rights-based animal rights. And that starts with Reagan. You know, we've never had a modern conversation about Reagan. We don't get off first base because no one knows who the hell we're talking about. The person who wrote the case for animal rights, who laid down rights-based animal rights, who is credited with getting rights over the species barrier, is unknown in the so-called animal rights movement. It is really beyond pathetic. We've got to do something about this, folks. We really do. OK, Earthlings, I'll sign off. <laughs> I'm going to uh, kick the cat. No, I won't, Rouge, that you're OK. So bye for now.